Barely Research Facts is a fact-based podcast brought to you by Art Now Thus, an experiential arts agency based out of Mumbai. Each week, we pick a word at random, dive into it and see where it brings us. We are your hosts. My name is Ragini and this is Shar. Welcome to episode 2 of our second season. So, we've got Fact Pack season 2. Woo, Ragini, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a fact pack season two with the usual great facts, good chat. But we're also throwing in more guests this season to help us get you facts with that expert edge because that's what people need, right? Right? Yeah. 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 But we're not enough. No, we're not enough. We need that, uh, that extra person who knows more than us. <laughs> <laughs> Which is every person, basically. <laughs> Okay, just so that I don't go start crying into my pillow. Um, <laughs> we started really strong with episode one. The word was power, which covered gun toting shrimps, pow puff girls and more. And I wow. can guarantee that this episode's just as good. The word for this episode is telegram. And in today's episode, we are going to talk about the last telegram ever sent, communicating telepathically and telegraphically with big-eared Martians, no small feet, and why in the world the unstoppable telegram had stops in it. That was very funny. Well done. Good summary. Know, just, <laughs> oh, thanks. A 10 out of 10. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to jump in with fact number one. The last telegram in India was sent on the 14th of July 2013, which is why our word for this episode is telegram. Big mystery solved there. All right, so just disclaimer, our facts for this episode, sort of, it is my facts for this episode, sort of very you know, flow between telegram and telegraph quite with gay abandon. So just go with the, roll with that uh, for me, please. <laughs> Hold us to the fact that it has to be telegram only. I don't think people are going to be that exacting. Don't worry, Rakhi. Okay. <laughs> They're very closely related. We'll, we'll let you go past on this one. Don't worry. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> well, now that's a relief and I can move forward. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, the telegram was once, of course, a revolutionary means of messaging. It's clear that However, that it no longer holds that stature. And, you know, that the whole story of just how the telegram went from being this amazing, you know, new means of like technology and messaging and communication to just being where it was when it finally shut down services in India, at least, is, is it's sweet and it's nostalgic and it's slightly heartbreaking. But it's also like mm-hmm. um, I came across this article uh, in Open Magazine that was written in July 2013, which is when just when the telegram were uh, the telegraph services were shutting in India. And the article documents the final days of the Central Telegraph office in Churchgate, Mumbai. And, you know, the, there are a bunch of lovely facts. We will put the link to this article in the blog for sure because it, it really is beautiful. But just a couple of facts that struck me was in the 1980s when, you know, when telegrams were in full, were full-blown as a messaging service, everyone was selling, sending telegrams everywhere all over the country. People mm. in the CTO, the, the staff of the CTO would send out about 3,000 telegrams every day at the time when it had slowly started becoming unviable and there was just a last-ditch attempt to see if they could still have the telegrams telegram services continue to run in India. In 2009, Mm -hmm. the cost of the telegram was raised from 5 rupees to 25 rupees per per 30 words. Yeah, it's quite a hike, right? Yeah. And it's 2009, which means that SMS was, you know, we had cheap SMS services. Maybe, I don't know, was WhatsApp a thing by then? I don't remember using it that much, but definitely emails were a thing. So, you know, you could email. Yeah, no, I don't think... um... I don't think WhatsApp was a thing. I do remember texting on my brick Nokia phone, though. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I remember sending it. Those were the days of SMS where you typed in your in your yeah. Nokia phone three times to get to the letter T. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you did it so quickly that you thought yeah. it was like a, a legit skill yeah, that yeah. you could when put on your resume. When by typing too much, you would, you would get some sort of like thumb disease. Good times, <laughs> really good times. <laughs> <laughs> but so you know and anyway this this hike in price did not really help it was already becoming a fast obsolete messaging mm. method and by 2013 when the CTO was on the verge of a shutdown the day this author visited the office at 8 p.m when the office was shutting down they had sent a total of 19 telegrams and it was apparently a better day than most I know. Yeah, I I can't believe they lasted that long, though. Yeah, I mean, Mm. yeah, I'm just thinking, like from the from maybe like from 2000 and the early 2000s, I guess, is when you know when Mm. cell phones came in and people started having other ways of communicating and 
Yeah. Stood together for a solid 13 years. Well done, guys. I know. Dragged it across the line. <laughs> And the article, so the article also talks about some really lovely stories about the people who worked at the CTO. This was my favorite part oh. about this whole, uh, about the article, because it's really, you know, when a lot of these guys, people who, who were working there in 2013 had taken mm. up the job about like 20, 25 years ago. And at that time, it was this really prestigious job that you got. And it was a matter of pride, you know, to be working in the yeah. telegram office. And they slowly watched these jobs that were so you know, after of all envy, become yeah. obsolete and obscure and they were just sort of living a journey with it. Mm. But they do talk, you know, one of the employees talks about his early days when there was a, a message from the Maharashtra governor's office and the message read, payment not received, starting. And the boss of the CTO was extremely worried because this person was starting now for the governor's bungalow to collect his payment. <laughs> <laughs> but when they checked, they realized that the telegraphist who had sent the message had misheard the Morse code. And it me- the message was supposed to be, payment not received, starving. So everyone breathed this out from oh. saying, it's okay, he's just dying of starvation. He's not actually on his way to the governor's office. <laughs> Minor problems. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as long as they're not... You know, but it's how you remember that you know, I, I i mean a lot of people in india will know this malgudi days uh, which yeah. is this amazing show based on the stories of rk lakshman uh, who was a really prolific writer back in the day in india but it does sound like a story out of malgudi days to me <laughs> it does. Uh, this is so cute <laughs> yeah uh, and there are a few more stories there are stories about this woman who you know wrote a telegram with a string of abusive words talking about how d- describe how she was harassed by somebody and the people oh at the CTO had to take a decision whether they would let this te- message pass with these abusive words or not <laughs> but they finally decided that because she was being you know it was her describing her harassment it should go through and then one time uh, there was a well-wisher who was reaching out to a thief to tell him that the cops were on his case and he should not come back home and, and they did not <laughs> send, they chose not to send that and not just they it's not a collective unit of the CTO that is deciding one employee yeah. is sitting somewhere and be like okay let's not send this message it sounds like this should not go through oh so, wow also I'd the love to have that power <laughs> I know it'd be great right I think they I should like mail, make a yeah. decision yeah probably um, said everyone at the CIA <laughs> like, I'd love to have that power <laughs> <laughs> yes, but an employee, uh, this employee called Pradeep Borse of the CTO does say, see, he says, we don't just blindly send anything. We're making decisions too. Aww. Which I think is one of the primary reasons why the Telegraph may have far spaced into obsolete. Mm. <laughs> because everyone was like, oh, wow, I can actually send my messages without somebody else reading them. Yeah, I can just send my dirty texts to my <laughs> wife's best friend. <laughs> Or husband's best friend. I don't know. I'm just creating a tawdry story out of this. But no, I'm sure there were yeah, very, very sweet Mills messages also sent. <laughs> so we've gone from Malkri days to Mills and Boons. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So just to give you a quick history on the telegram in India, just because it's had a fascinating history in India. Uh, mm. The first telegram chapter in India began in 1850 when the East India Company strung up the country's first 27-mile long telegraph lying between Calcutta and Diamond Harbour, which is at the periphery of Calcutta. By 1865, there were 17,500 miles of telegraph lines. And by 1939, India's 100,000 miles of lines were carrying 17 million telegraphic messages a year. That's a lot. In 1870, submarine cables had been set up between India and Britain. Basically, you know, the officers sitting in London could pass messages and be in the know what was going on in the subcontinent here. And one of the first uses of the telegraph is recorded to be the carriage of the news of the fall of Rangoon in the Anglo-Burmese War, the second Anglo-Burmese War, to Lord Dalhousie in Calcutta in 1852. Another really interesting story about the, the telegram and its uses is that apparently the squashing of the mutiny of 1857 can be attributed to the telegram. This is not 100% though, but the story does go that, in, I mean, for those people who are not aware. In 1857, there was an uprising by Indian soldiers in the British Army against the working conditions that they were being subjected to. Yeah, it was the first uprising, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Mm. Uh, Much, much before the actual struggle for independence. Mm. But at this point, so there was an uprising. The British, however, did find out about it. They squashed it and nothing really came out of it at the time. But one of the reasons why this apparently happened is because the British officials got news of it over telegrams across the country and they were able to squash it in time. Again, like I said, I do not really know if this happened 100%. Uh, the, the revolt and the squash of the revolt definitely did. But the telegram might just be an unfortunate villain without really needing to be one in the story. <laughs> it sounds like something plausible. <laughs> uh, very soon, though, there were, there were telegrams going up and down India and 
the Indians, the English alike just took to it. Uh, and there were wires uh, going around the country and uh, or tars as they are called in Hindi. Mm. Uh, the Hindi word for wire is tar, quite literally. So now, in 2013, when the telegram services were shutting in India, there were my, many people scrambling to be the last person to send a telegram ever, many of them ironically doing it for the first times in their life. However, the honor, because, you know, a lot of young kids were just like, ooh, cool. However, the honor finally went to a Kavita Vagmare from Nagpur on July 14, 2013 at 11.55 p.m. She sent a message to her mother, and it's basically a poem that translates to, that when translated sort of praises and salutes her mother for her love and her care and her upbringing and thanks the telegram staff for their 163-year-long service. We Aww. will put a picture of the last telegram ever sent to our show notes, obviously. But also, if you're wondering, in the meantime, if, if you've just missed the boat forever, now that the last telegram is sent, you can just never send a telegram again. Fear not. Apparently, you still can. Oh, uh, that's anticlimactic. From... <laughs> <laughs> Poor Kavita. Yeah. Kavita's like, God uh, damn it. Uh, <laughs> I wrote a poem. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the International Telegram Company inherited yeah. the Western Union's cable and telex operations, and they still run a telegraph service for those who may need it. Now, mostly a lot of legal services use this because, you know, if you're sending a legal notice, you want there to be a record of the notice, and, and so it helps with that. But also, if somebody just wants to say a very expensive sup to a friend, um, <laughs> you could do that too. And we'll, we'll put the link in. Well, that's good to know. Enjoy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that is the wonderful story of well, the history of the telegram in India, the really glorious history that it has had, and then just how quickly it fell into obscurity. And I mean, that was but super the fact that you can still send a telegram, so that's a positive ending. Yeah, with with like a, a little tidbit of like important information that is useful today. Even I mean, I'm super <laughs> yes. impressed. Like, should we stop there? Maybe we should stop there. <laughs> stop. <laughs> You've done such a good job. I love that. I love the um, um, the power that the operators had the nosy uh, the nosy telegram operators i know it would have been a perfect job <laughs> for like someone i'm not saying me, me. but maybe me <laughs> yeah. it. it really feel like we missed a calling yeah and a time period <laughs> um okay now look i'm a lover of science fiction this is completely out of the blue <laughs> yes yes um, <laughs> good segue yeah, we don't do segues and all here. Let's just just He's know. Just a sharp, just sharp brutal turn. transition. <laughs> <laughs> so I love science fiction. It's probably my favorite genre of series, TV series, or movie, or anything really. Do you like science fiction, Ragni? I love science fiction. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. So on a completely unrelated note, <laughs> I'm going to tell you the totally true, extremely believable story of Dr. Hugh Mansfield Robinson, who sent a message. Written in Martian from London to Mars. Wow. Okay. Why you ruminate? <laughs> Why <laughs> you ruminate a little bit on that? So this was in 1926. So we're well into the era of the telegram. You know, telegrams flying all over the place. So the best way for Huey Hewerson to uh, send his message was obviously our friend for this episode, the telegram. Mm. So not only was the destination unique, the message was too. So here's what it said. Opesti Nipitia Secumba. They oh, are gibberish. Is that Martian, by the way? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Huge spoiler. It's gibberish. <laughs> so these words written in Martian were relayed from London to the Red Planet on the 27th of October, 1926. The sender was good old Huey. <laughs> and the intended recipient was a six foot, big eared Martian lady called Umaruru, with whom he'd been in telepathic contact. Now, let's digest huh. that for a second. <laughs> and in the meanwhile, I'll tell you a little bit about Hugh. So Hugh Robinson was a former town clerk um, of Shoreditch and a doctor of laws. Uh, this is how he's been described. So this isn't me Not making just one law. designations. <laughs> yeah. More than one law. Um, <laughs> now, to me, I've seen a picture of him. We'll put it in the show notes. He looks a bit like Sean Astin, the Hobbit from The Lord of the Rings. <laughs> <laughs> so basically like the least so maybe the lady was just normal height <laughs> maybe <laughs> oh my God. so maybe 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 
there she was. <laughs> Poor thing. I feel so bad for her being called out like twice in this article for being big eared. Like, let the big eared people be. <laughs> I mean, aliens. <laughs> so now Robinson, he didn't mess around. He was nothing if not detailed about his interactions and knowledge about the Martian race. He first heard from the Martians in about 1918. His astral body supposedly visited Mars on several occasions. He describes a planet populated by men seven to eight feet tall, while the ladies were over six feet. This is debated after his Hobbit connection. <laughs> they have large ears, he said, sticking out on each side of the head, a huge shock of hair mast high, and a Chinese cast of features. So, okay, Hugh, Not we'll see you <laughs> being slightly racist. They have great airships run by electricity, he said. All their power is electrical, run from the harnessing of the canals and waterfalls in the mountains. They are consequently many generations in advance of us in wireless knowledge. So I guess that's believable. Yeah. He also described their society, believing that labor strikes were unknown, that the population was decentralized out of the cities, and that their numbers included a lower caste of beings lacking in intelligence and with the heads shaped like that of a walrus. It's, I think it's interesting. Wow. This sounds like his solutions to the problems in 1918. Because... <laughs> um, uh, you know, he mentioned labor strikes and he mentioned decentralization from the major cities. And I, I think it's because it matches what was happening in the political landscape ah. in 1918. So, you know, they oh. had a lot of labor strikes. Much and deduction. Well done. Yeah, I know. I'm just <laughs> call me Sherlock. Sherlock and an economist all in one. Um <laughs> So yeah, maybe our little Huey was a bit worried about the state of the world and was just an idealist and wanted to escape. I can't blame him, yeah. honestly. And also a really good imagination, you know, like we're laughing, but like, honestly, it's great yeah. imagination. And proactive yeah. about it. Like he sent a telegram yeah. to them and traveled there astrally. Yeah. Can you say you've done that already? Recall. No. <laughs> I but know I, can I say that if I would have sent someone multiple messages saying you have big ears, <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised <laughs> if I didn't get a response. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, so now the lady in question, as Ra who Ragni has mentioned, Umaruru, he claimed to be in regular telepathic contact with this girl from Mars. She's described as very fair, oh, shock, with a sweet <laughs> face and big ears that did not especially detract from her beauty. Oh, gosh. All right, Hugh. Umaruru is like, uh, thanks, bro. <laughs> anyway, her name meant loved one. He at least gave her a nice name. Ah, and despite English her... language. I'm genuinely English language. <laughs> I think he might have been Martian. I think it's a safe deduction to say that it's Martian. <laughs> and Umaruru um, was like, that's wrong, bro. <laughs> yeah. It means big ears. <laughs> <laughs> Um, oh, so, despite her great big Argo years, she was a close friend of the director. <laughs> <laughs> so, she was a close friend of the director of Mars's biggest wireless station. Um, with her help, uh, Robinson can hope to convince the world of his interplanetary psychic wanderings. So, eventually, he wanted something selfish out of this, which is, look at me, I'm an astral wanderer. And with some more context, in 1926, Mars was 8 million miles closer to Earth than average. Um, so astronomers everywhere were polishing their telescopes to make observations. In London, Dr. Robinson instead sought the services of the central post office, which is like the um, the body that was controlling telegrams yeah. at the time, near St. Paul's. The post office had no precedent for such a long distance message, uh, but was very happy to take Robinson's custom. I mean, you'd do it, wouldn't you? You'd do it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm assuming it'd be a very, very, very expensive message to send if you're saying, yeah, I'm sending it to Mars. <laughs> yeah, I think that's why he kept it short because uh, it was 18 <laughs> pence per word uh, at the time. Now, an official from the Central Radio Office, also probably the father of capitalism and modern day customer care, <laughs> commented, if people wish to send messages even to the moon and the man thereon and are prepared to pay for them, there does not seem to be any valid reason why the post office should refuse revenue. <laughs> All right. Yes, okay. Except for the fact that you can't actually deliver it. Yeah, it's, it's fine. Just give me your money. That, that's, um, a small, that's a small glitch in this problem. Nobody yeah. cares about that. <laughs> We've sent it, Hugh. So Robinson was billed 18 pence per word. 
for the radio transmission equivalent to the long distance ship rate, uh, which is what I'm assuming the telegraph operators scrambled around to figure out. So alas, his pennies were wasted. Shock again. Um, <laughs> a day later, the post office re- confirmed that no signals had been received that could have emanated from the red planet. Uh, and Robinson dismissed the negative result, obviously, claiming that other stations might yet receive something and later saying, but never proving, that mysterious replies had been received. Few were convinced. Hmm. Uh, Robinson made a further attempt two years later during another close pass of Mars. This time, the message was Mar la oi da Earth, com gamar, which, Ragini, what do you think it was? I think you're speaking fluent Martian. <laughs> well done. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, it's gibberish. Uh, so it, it's um, love to Mars from Earth. God is love. Again. Um, what if they don't believe in God? Yeah, I mean, I don't think you really cared about the Martians per se. I mean, <laughs> I think you just cared about, you know, who will make mm-hmm. to the world that he was communicating with them. He, They could have been saying something completely different. Like, please turn off your telegrams. <laughs> They're just annoying. Um So again, no signal was received, at least not by radio. I'm advised by my telepathic friends on Mars that they did not receive our message owing to the layers of rarefied air made up hue. (laughs) Um, And this is this is this was covered by the press at the time and not just the British press, like American press was ridiculing him as well. So the Pittsburgh Post observed that the Quote, apparent failure of his attempt to communicate with Mars by radio early today did not discourage the psychic student, neither did the attitude of his wife, who sniffed at her husband's spiritual wanderings among the planets, accompanied by a Martian girlfriend with big ears, poor Umaruru. <laughs> poor thing, dude. Nor the frankly sceptical attitude of the world in general and men of science in particular. So they very kindly stated how he was persistent not believed. in his... Yeah, not believed and persistent despite th- despite that. So Robinson never gave up his quest to speak to the Red Planet. In 1929, he tried again using an ordinary wireless set augmented with a, quote, psychotelepathic motor meter. In 1930, he even founded a college of telepathy whose staff included a telepathic dog called Nell. <laughs> um, who wants to bet that Nell was the only empo- employee? <laughs> And then in 1933, he claimed to have recorded the voice of Cleopatra, now a jilted farmer's wife living in a glass house on Mars. Now, all jokes aside, clearly Hugh had some mental health issues and we empathize with, you know, his um, his predicament. But you've got to say it's quite an interesting story. I want to end yeah. with uh, his a rich fantasy life. For sure. Yeah, bless him. And I want to end with his uh, a quote from his fiercest critic, his wife. <laughs> After the 1928 attempt failed, she's quoted as saying, I don't know anything about this Mars affair. I've refused to have the experiments conducted in this house while I remain in it. I don't know whether anyone encouraged my husband, but there will be no more of that foolishness in this house. End quote. And that's the story of little old Hugh with his Martian girlfriend and his uh, gibberish telegrams. <laughs> Bless and his very angry wife. And his very angry wife. <laughs> oh, stop. <laughs> Come on, go with me on this. Come on. Stop. stop oh, you, God. Stop. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> clearly, I lack the imagination that you had. Sorry. Stop. <laughs> yes, yes no, I don't want to. <laughs> uh, okay, well... <laughs> Okay, and the worst segue award goes to... Okay, so if, if you all didn't understand already, what we're trying to do is try to introduce our next segment, which is where I explain how does stop become synonymous with telegrams world over. Mm. Oh, I want to know stop. this. Stop. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, this was literally the first thing I thought about when we decided this would be a word. And I was mm-hmm. like, oh, what do I think of when I think of telegrams? And I was like, oh, I think of stop. Okay, let's stop researching. No, that's not what I thought. <laughs> I decided to go. So now when Morse code was originally introduced, it had only capital letters and no punctuation. And at most times it wasn't really much of a problem. But during the First World War, it was imperative that messages go through like precise and accurate and there's just absolutely no room for misunderstanding because needless to say, a misunderstood message could be fairly disastrous Mm -hmm. in a war-like situation. So the custom arose of using the word stop between sentences in military telegrams so that any sort of vague 
phrases or ambiguous phrases would not be misinterpreted. The government began to employ it widely as a precaution against having messages sort of misunderstood. And apart from using just stop for a for a period or a, or a full stop, they also started using words to indicate other punctuation. So you had they would spell out comma and oh. apparently colon and semicolon as well, which I find kind of I don't know, I can't get on board with, you know, needing to send the words colon and semicolon in a telegram. I barely yeah. send that in a text message now. I, I think they were more stringent about grammar at that. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Who dis? <laughs> yeah. You up. <laughs> <laughs> you up. <laughs> And they would use the word query to to denote a question mark. Okay. So oh all of this is actually going on. Yeah. yeah. I, query, comma, stop, I'm on board with. Colon, semicolon, I just don't see the point. Yeah. And especially semicolon. Like, it just sounds, anyway, it just feels <laughs> extravagant in my opinion. Yeah. What a socialist. <laughs> uh, <laughs> mm. Of all of these, though, the word stop. Uh, has come into the most widespread use. Even after punctuation was introduced and it was possible to send punctuation, people still continue to use stop fashionably as this thing that they did. And so then I was also thinking, I was like, okay, you know, like, I'm just like, oh, is stop the only thing I think about because I think in English and I only think of telegrams in English. Mm. But I was like, no, you know, when I think about it in India, I mean, I've seen shows that have shown tele- or movies that have shown telegrams going even in India, even if the telegram is in Hindi, I've still heard stop. Oh, that's very so interesting. And turns out that apparently, even though the word stop is an English word, clearly, it seems to have stopped as a punctuation, seems to have come into general use in all languages that use telegraphing, uh, regardless of what the language is, mm. which I thought was really interesting. Yeah. So regardless of what language you're sending a telegraph in, as long as you will use the word stop to denote a full stop. And See, noticeably, so even though you don't need to, because there is punctuation. Yeah, because yeah. you don't, I mean, it's not, it's not um, surprising, but it's not something you think of immediately. I'd never thought of yeah. telegrams in Hindi using yeah. the word stop. Hmm. Yeah, I've thought of telegrams a lot these last weeks. <laughs> <So. laughs> really? I was just here researching Mars and <laughs> you're doing the actual, like, actual <laughs> On <research>. ground. <laughs> what was happening on Earth? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But you know what? Also, in, in context of what we were just talking about, about this, you know, this this lexicon that we have now because of texting, which is like, you know, just certain things like IRL for in real life or LOL mm. or whatever, like these things that have become like abbreviations that, have, that are so commonplace now, but are unique to a texting yeah. culture. Apparently, the same thing happened with telegraphy. So mm. telegrams, because they were priced by the word and brevity was obviously the order of the day and it was important that, you know, messages be yeah. clear, but short. So, you know, which is why when we think of telegrams, we think of this really terse messages with like stop every yeah. five words or something. But turns out it was a like, so it there was this whole code language that came into use to make to make this more efficient. Oh, it wow. was a huge business opportunity because companies were publishing code books like and oh. selling them out so that people would. Uh, and one of the few really cool ones that I came across is uh, there's the word I'm going to spell it out because I really for the life of me do not know how you say this. Uh, but it's C-O-Q-U-A-R-U-M. I thought it was a short form for something, but it's, I, I couldn't find what it was. So I'm just going to go with it. But apparently, if you got a, a telegram that just said this one word, you could reliably be informed that your engagement has been broken off. <laughs> so the next time, instead of ghosting somebody, you can just send them this and they'll be as confused. Oh, uh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. And in business, apparently, you could ask someone to lozenge, which is L-O-Z-E-N-G-E. Mm-hmm. And that means, this is exactly what it means, yeah? What shall we do with the documents and bills of the leading attached? What? <laughs> yeah. To which the stern reply would be, <laughs> giggle. <laughs> which would mean, use your discretion as to the delivery of documents. Oh. Cute, wow. right? <laughs> <laughs> all right so with that we've reached the end of this episode i really hope you've enjoyed the episode if you have we would really appreciate it if you could go and rate us if you're listening to this on spotify or itunes and if you really really like the episode then drop us a review maybe it helps us so much and we will be eternally grateful also we have revamped our popular newsletter which used to be a culture mailer that we sent out once a month it's now a culture newsletter called probably relevant it's free it's 
comes directly to your inboxes and it has a bunch of cool stuff that we come across world over across the internet also a lot of stuff that we research for our episodes but don't actually eventually make it to the final episode so if you want some bonus content that's a great place to head over at you can sign up via our website at www.artnowdas.in or you can hit the link in our bio on instagram we're at belly research pack and you can also drop us a mail at hi at artnowdas.in we will see you with episode 3 in a couple of weeks until then take care remember to keep your alien girlfriends and your martian wives and your <laughs> telegrams to uranus i don't know and your sedic book semicolons out of your telegrams oh shit i shouldn't have said that today. as always this episode was edited by mohit chandelia music for the podcast is by charita arora see you guys see you soon bye